Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It is not an interlude. Praise the Lord. We can't be praising the Lord sitting down. Praise the Lord. Let someone that has breath and is thankful to God for grace, for mercy, for salvation, for privilege and opportunity of access to God without the necessity of another man. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. You can, we can be seated now. I just wanted to prove that, you know, my request that we should praise the Lord actually means that we should indeed praise the Lord. And it, is, it wasn't an intent to get our attention. That was not the intent. It was a call to praise. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're all welcome to today's um, 33rd day of our, of our Lenten diet. And as we come before the presence of God, thanks to those who could make it physically, we also acknowledge those who have joined online via YouTube or via Zoom. And as we come before the presence of God to sharpen ourselves, to, to, strengthen, our, to strengthen ourselves in the place of uh, study of God's word, that um, our hearts that will be truly equipped by God to, to, read, to, to do his will in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you. We give you thanks, we give you praise for your word says that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in their midst. Father, we are not one, we're not two, we're not three. We are gathered in your midst physically, oh God, spiritually and also those who are joining online. For a time of refreshing, for a time of study of your word and of a time of fellowshipping and learning from one another through your word. Father, we ask, O oh God, that you speak to us today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, that you strengthen us in this period and in this season of Lenten, Lord God Almighty, that we might be fully equipped to do your will and your counsel in the name of Jesus. We thank you for our spiritual fathers. We thank you for those uh, our spiritual leaders. Lord, we ask that you continue to strengthen them also in the name of Jesus. As a church, Lord, may we continue to grow from strength to strength and from grace and from glory to glory in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for in Jesus' name we are prayed. Praise the Lord. Amen. So today's, um, today's as I've said, today is day 33. And the topic for today is the cost of of discipleship the cost of discipleship losing the love of money this is a very very <laughs> this is a very very um, interesting topic and you know when i was told that um, i will be leading this particular uh, bible study for today coordinating it we're all going to it's, a, it's an interactive one you know, I was wondering why, why, <laughs> why this topic? I was asking God, God, why this topic on, on losing the love of money? But we all know that this is one, this is one topic that uh, everybody is very, very sensitive, uh, is very sensitive to, and it's a, it, it could tend to be, it could tend to be a bit, um, how do I put it, uh, touchy. <laughs> Some people will say, "Give I can, I mean, you can take everything from me, but don't don't touch my money." Amen. So our text for today is taken from Matthew chapter nineteen, Matthew nineteen, verse sixteen. That's our main text, Matthew nineteen sixteen to twenty two. And if you could, I believe we have a, a roving mic, and so we're going to make it very very participatory. And so, if you would like to read that scripture for us. If someone would like to read that scripture for us, I know it's on the screen. But I like us. Okay, God bless you, my brother. Even though it's on the screen, it's always good to open this Bible. Or if you, you can also read from the screen if you want. 
if you don't have your Bible. But if he wants to read, if he wants to read from his Bible, I recommend it. We're in the days of digit. We're in the digital age. Yes. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said. We know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach in the way of the God in accordance with the truth. Yeah. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their, their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the tax. No, that's it's supposed to be Matthew 19. Matthew 19. I think you can from verse 16. Yeah. That's NIV, yes. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin they use for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them. No, it's not. Sorry. Okay, so uh, because of time, it's better to just read it from the screen. But God bless you, my brother. Thank you so much. Why don't you read from the screen? Read from the screen. Now behold, one came and said to him, good teacher, what good thing shall I do to that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbors. You shall love your neighbors as you love yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Amen. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. God bless you, my brother. Thank you very much. Um, before we go into the introduction, I would just like to uh, say one or two things based on um, my, my own study of this. And as I said, it's going to be interactive. Um, there are some key words I noticed there. The man came to Jesus and was using the word good. <laughs> it's because it said, good, good, said good, good master. <laughs> what, would I, what can we do to enter into the kingdom? You know, what good, he said, good master, what good deeds can, shall we do? I'm just paraphrasing that we may enter into the kingdom. And, and so one of the things I learned from there is, you know, this man believed that it is by good deeds, that good, deed, good deeds are enough to enter into, into the kingdom, okay? And one of the things that they, I also noticed about the scripture is that it also means that it is possible to keep all the commandments, as much, not, maybe not 100%, but this man said that all of this he has kept. I'm sure he wasn't lying. Otherwise, the scripture might have said, Jesus might not have told him, but maybe the scripture has said he lied to Jesus, but we're not told that he lied. And we have a reference also in the Bible. Paul said when it comes to the law, Apostle Paul, he said he's, he's, he kept it. Was, it just takes discipline. But there was one aspect that Jesus Christ saw that he lacked, and that was that he had great possession and he knew that all I just needed, all Jesus needed to sell him was, okay, he said, you have kept everything, 99%, let's even assume 99%, but lackest out one, 1%, which is what? Go sell all that you have. Come follow me. And then you have, uh, and come follow me. And the man became, and became sorrowful. So again, that also again emphasizes the fact that this money issue is a very, very serious issue. And together, and with those who are also online, we are all going to participate. Amen. So we now come to the introduction. I'm not going to read the introduction. As I said, it's going to be participatory. So if anybody wants to read the introductory part 
uh, introduction part of today's uh, uh, topic. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. The scripture makes us to understand that the love of money is the root of all evil. Whatever money we have as Christ followers belongs originally to God. We are only stewards. Therefore, God expects us to make wise use of money in ways that will glorify him. Our attitudes, responses, and dispositions to issues relating to money tell whether we are good or bad stewards of money. God gives power to make money. Money gives security and an answer to all things. Ecclesiastes 10, 19. But could also be a God. No disciple under the influence of the power of love of money can live a life that is pleasing to God. Amen. Thank you very much, ma'am. Okay. You want to say something? Yes, please. Yeah, so there is a place where she read that yes. um, said um, the second to the last yes. um, line. Line. He said, "But could also be a god." So Correct. I'm wondering: is money a god, or is human beings or believers that make it a god? Good. That's that's those are that's that's a good question that we we would actually would we would actually um, we should actually consider. So. Is it the human beings that have made money a god? Or is money itself a god? Um, much as, I mean, we uh, does anybody have anything? I, I can respond to that, but I don't know if anybody wants to respond to that because this is also about Bible study. Okay, sir. So we have Sir Upaha. Those online, we are watching if anybody wants to. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I think uh, apart from money, whatever you place your heart on, not just money alone, it becomes like a God to you. Money in particular, you, make, you decide to make money a God because you worship the money. You boast for money. You use it to make, boast in your life. So as far as you are concerned, when you have money, it's like you are now worshiping God. And if you are, worship, you are worshiping money, and if you are worshiping money, it becomes your God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. We, are, we also have a contribution here. It's getting very interesting. So whatever we whatever we, we give attention to or we give power to becomes a God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Online, think, we are coming online very soon. The operating word we should use here is love for money. Uh, like the introduction say, no disciple under the influence of the power of love of money under the influence of the power of love of money it's not like money is not good money is good but how do you uh, relate to the money do you now think that with money you can oppress do you now think with money nothing else matters do you now think with money all other people around you should worship you. Do you now leave God that has created you and has given you the power to make money in the first place yeah. to now believe money is all and all for you? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daddy. Um, we, we, will go on, we will go online, then we'll come to my brother, uh, Brother Rotimi, and also we we'll come to Dr. Asher. Online, please. Good evening, everyone. My Good name evening. is Sam. so so that you are clear. What there is a question before we go to the full text itself, yes, and I before know. we go to discussion, question, question about whether money is yes. God or whether exactly. You, Thank you very much. So everything God created, He created for our own good. So when we take anything He created and re use it to replace the place of God in our lives that becomes our God. So anything I'm worshiping and takes the place of God in my life, whether it's money or children or any possession, that thing becomes my God. Thank so money is much, God. It's me that will make it God. You're very, you're very spot on. And all the, all the responses are quite, quite 
just to add to what has been said, for me, I think it is, it boils down to the relationship you have with money, number one, and your perception of money that then makes it a God in your life. One thing is clear as Christians, God look, desires more than anything else, our hearts. Our hearts forms a key area that God wants. God wants to take over your heart. The Holy Spirit desires your heart. The Bible says, with the heart a man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The work of salvation starts in your heart. Now, money become, therefore becomes your God when your heart is overtaken by money and the love of it. Where it consumes you Every other thing becomes secondary in, the, in relation or in respect to money. At that point, money becomes your God. So at, at, the, at the bottom of it is what is the relationship you have with money? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And, and so he says it's, 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 the, it's our view of money. What relationship do we um, do we have, I mean, how do we perceive money and what relationship do we have with it? Do, does it become the primary thing in our hearts? Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Yes, mommy. Well, I just want to add another side to it. I accept everything that has been said, that you make money your God the way you relate to money. But in Greek mythology, there's nothing that's not, that they don't worship. And there's a God of money. So money can be a God. There's a God of wealth. In Greek mythology, that people can worship when they want to yes. prosper. So that's just the other side. Of it. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank, and that, and that is very, very spot on, actually. So everything, everything, you know, in those days, you know, some people, you can, some, someone might say that. So oh, you see this, uh, you see this, our collection box is wood. They will carve graven image and made out of wood and start worshiping it and bow to it. Anything we submit ourselves to becomes God, and, and indeed there is God of money. And don't also forget that, um, you know, the Bible says the heaven is God and the earth he has given to the children of man. Now, when man lost his dominion by sinning, it gave it, I mean, the, the earth now, Adam actually handed it more like gave that power and dominion to the devil. But with Jesus Christ, we are now able to appropriate, you know, that dominion you know, in Christ Jesus again. Otherwise, remember that even Jesus Christ himself, and it's interesting, it was during the time of Lenten, like this, like we're going through right now. The Bible says that the, the devil did what? Took him to the what? To the, to the, to the pinnacle, to the, to the top of the mountain, and showed him what? And showed him all the glories of the earth, and said that, look, these things belong to me. You know, if you bow down to me, I will give them to you. The devil wasn't lying there, you know, so praise God. Another thing I would like to add, and thank you very much, Matt, for starting, off, starting us off with that. So what is love in this context, the love of money? I went to check the dictionary, the, the Bible dictionary, to add to what uh, uh, Mommy Ashu said. You know, and it, it in the Old Testament, it is described, the word love could also mean Ahab, or uh, Ahab, I don't know the pronunciation, A-H-A-B, Ahab. And like um, our brother also said, um, uh, brother wrote to me, it is a strong emotional attachment. It is defined as a strong emotional attachment to and desire either to possess or be in the presence of the object. So that object could be money, as you have said, could be anything else. Praise the Lord. Amen. So it says that we are stewards. It says we are only stewards. Of, of money and everything belongs originally to God. And it says our attitude and our responses and disposition to issues relating to money will tell whether we are good or bad stewards of money. On a lighter note, let me just say something. Have we noticed that if you, or let me, let me speak for myself, I've observed something that if you belong to any Christian group or association, every discussion goes well and people participate in it, particularly if it's like a WhatsApp discussion. Once you mention come and donate, what happens? 
everywhere becomes quiet. And this has been tested since the days of BlackBerry that I've done a lot of association and not normal secular association. This has been my, my, my observation. If you belong to Koi Club, Island Club, and all those clubs, and they say, come and donate, you see people, they begin to drop. But when it comes to Christianity, any association, Christianity, they will say, once you mention money like this, say, ah, what are they going to use it for? <laughs> and there's a part of the scripture, which is not part of our text today, that, you know, Jesus, it was, Jude, it was, uh, was it Judas that said, all of this money, it would have been better if they had gotten all of this money, you know, and collected it to give to the poor. But the Bible says something, it said, that was not the true intent of his heart. He wanted the money to be collected so that he could put his hand in the cookie jar. Praise God. So let's go to the, to the discussion. The love of money is the root of evil. And I think we have discussed it. Unless anybody has anything to add to it, I think we can now go to, um, to, the, second, to the second discussion. The love of money is the root of all evil. That is the possession, the strong emotional attachment to or desire to be possessed or to be in the presence of money is the, is the root of all evil. So let's go to the second, second top, I mean the second discussion topic, subtopic. What does the Bible say about money from the following passages? Ecclesiastes 7, verse 12. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 12. Anybody want to read? And I love this. And I love this. Yes. Okay, so we have it. It says, for wisdom is a defense. Oh, someone, someone is online. Yes, please. Someone online, please. Sorry, my brother. I was saying, I, I felt that uh, we didn't deal with number one properly because what we yes, were Yes, we asked whether, oh, sorry, we didn't see the light. Yes, go ahead, ma'am. We, we are talking about whether our money is God or not, but this passage, a lot of people have asked, why are we saying that the love of money is the root of all evil? Is it that money is evil? So it's, a, it's good to explain what the Bible means by that. So I think that um, that uh, statement is about how we make money, what we are willing to do to make money. And what is our stewardship of money? That is the statement is being, that is being given. Money is a resource given by God. And the Bible tells us that the blessing of God makes us rich and has no sorrow. So the love of money here is about someone's inordinate or wrongful desire for money to wrongfully get money, to desire wrongfully, you know, and uh, get money in any way inordinately convert money in such a way that one has no regards for God or even the rights of others. Am I ready to just do anything, even if it means compromising my faith to make money? When I'm doing something like serving in the church or helping others, is it money that drives my motive? Is it for me, as long as making money is concerned, the end justifies the means? For a disciple, God is interested in both the means of making money and the end. The means must be righteous to lead to acceptable end. So anyone who has this mindset will definitely be involved in all unrighteous and evil acts to make money. We have a lot of things that we are we hear happening in the country while people make money these days. Evil here means sin, unrighteousness, things that are morally wrong. The other part of the statement is about when God blesses us with money. When he makes us rich, what do I do with the resources he has blessed me with? What are my priorities when spending this money? As a disciple who has been converted, is my pocket converted? Are my interests more on spending this money on myself or in kingdom investments? Am I blessing others with the money God has given me and also blessing the church? Imparting life with the money I have been given, not acquiring all sorts of assets, you know, or even using it to lure people into sin, living irresponsibly. It's my money it's for me, myself, and I. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, man. Thank you very much for, for those insights. So essentially, she's saying that, you know, being as as uh, back to that, I love this definition. So pardon me. Um, 
the strong emotional attachment to and desire to, to possess or be in, in the presence or to, to have money will lure, has lured a lot of people, you know, into so many, you know, evil deeds, evil acts, as we even see in our, in our nation, in our country, Nigeria today. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Sir Okpaka. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The money we are discussing now, is it the, in the sense of a temporary life or just because the evil aspect of people are talking of money, money, you see, if we are, it seems we are discussing physical money. But you know, for me, within the Bible, it's just a reference. Because anything that we worship is like money. Anything that occupies our heart, just like Ruth me said, is, is, it can be called money. But when we are discussing money, because sometimes you may be serving, you have the talent to serve in the church, the capacity to serve in one or the other. It, it may not be physical money, and you need to brag. You may have the knowledge of God. You, be, you need to brag. Those are the kind of, they are money in, as far as we are concerned. And some people use it to, they make friends and they collect money because of it. They, I've seen people who, they go to people's house to pray and they ask them for money. So when we are talking of money, money, I, I'm, I don't believe it. We're just talking of physical money, people making money and doing business. I believe that it's kind of spiritual money. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you very much. All of that, I don't want us to be distracted. Um, um, into debating too much of that, but thank you very much, sir. Your, your, your point is well taken, sir. But as we go into the scripture, and that's why it's good to go into the Bible. Thank you, sir, for, for that uh, good question and also comment. As we go into the scripture, then we'll begin to see the context in which we are, we're talking about here. But just to quickly say that, yes, in the context of this scripture, of this uh, topic today, we're talking about money, and we'll see it. And so if we read if we go to Ecclesiastes 7, 7 verse 12, I'll read it because of time. It says, for wisdom is a defense. And this is a scripture I love so much because I've used it a lot in my life. Wisdom is a defense and money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Any, if I've read all the scriptures and I believe a lot of us have, have read all the scriptures for today. What is our understanding of this scripture? Any understanding from this scripture? What do we understand by this scripture? Yes, my brother. Please, can we give him a mic? Someone can then open to Ecclesiastes 10, verse 19. Go ahead. Okay, so one thing I understand from this passage, from this verse, is that Wisdom is a, is a defense. You can use wisdom to defend yourself in most cases, as money is also a defense. But this advan but this um, excellence of wisdom that we are talking about is like the way you use the money. So, the, so as it says, wisdom gives life to those who, to, to those who have it. Yeah. What I'm trying, what I understand is that if you have wisdom, in the, if you apply wisdom to the way you are using your money, you, you, if you apply wisdom to the way you are using your money, wisdom shall keep you. Praise God. Please, let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Mommy, please, I, I owe him something. I'm going to give you something. And God bless you. Because you are very, my understanding, you are very, very spot on. Let's go online and let's get more, let's get more, um, more insights. Online, please. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I just want to read that uh, 712 in another version, NLT. It says, um, wisdom and money can get you almost anything, but only wisdom can save your life. I think it's self-explanatory. And 10, sorry, did you want to say something? No, I wanted to read. I thought you said we should read the next passage, 1019. Okay, okay ma, you can go, you can go ahead. A party gives laughter, wine gives happiness, and money gives everything. <laughs> thank you very, thank you, thank you very much, man. Okay, so I, as as we have read that scripture, you see, 
the, the reason why I'm pausing on this particular scripture is this. A lot of times, you know, it is very easy to use scriptures out of context. And I have heard for about 30 years of my life, I've heard preachers say, money is a defense, money is a defense. But guess what? And that's why I want to give that my, that my son. That's why I want to give him money. It's money I'm going to give to you. Because it is not flesh and blood. That it, they never, when they are using this scripture, most of the people that preach or that use it as an excuse in the name of Christianity to do evil acts, to get money, like mommy okay, 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 okay said, they will say, let me tell you something. Money is important to the kingdom. Money is a defense. We need this money to defend. There is a place for money as a defense, and there is a place for wisdom as a defense. But what this scripture, as my brother has said, is that, you know, there is an aspect that money cannot give you, that wisdom can give you. Life. Praise God. You know, they said this is Bible study. So me, I like us to dig into it. So then in that other scripture, Ecclesiastes 10, 19, it says labor, um, I mean, Ecclesiastes 10, 19, that we have read. It says a feast is made for laughter and wine make it merry. Colon, colon, but money answereth all things. This is another one that they've used. They say, money, let me tell you something. Money answereth all things. Money answereth all things. In this context, what does he say? What is our understanding of it? Anybody? Let's put up the, let's put up that, um, let's put it up again. I don't want to speak about this. I want you to speak about the seven. Yes, my grandma. It's just a short one that you can lose the money you make, but you can't lose wisdom. Exactly. Once you have wisdom, it's there. It's there. Hallelujah. Thank, thank you very much. You know, when I was preparing for this, I wrote down a, lot, a number of things. He say, I, I says, um, okay, but let's look at chapter 10, verse 19 first. I, I like to get response. What's our understanding of that scripture? Let me tell you my own understanding. What he's saying here is this, and if you read some other, other version, you, you might, it, it will help to shed light. But me, maybe because I'm a literature student, it is KJV first or nothing. Less, I don't want to read any watered down version like NIV where they have removed some and contemporary English. They help to understand, but it's always good to look at KV, KJV. And this is English language. It's not in, it says a feast is made for laughter, comma, and wine make it merry. Colon, not semicolon. So what's that next statement or phrase? It says, but money answereth all things. All things in this context, in fact, you see that the things there is in italics, which means that a lot of times as Bible students, it could actually mean that it is used to expand it. So if you, so, and it says, but money answer it all. What is the all in this context? It's talking about feasts. That is for feasts, you need money. For wine, you need money. But it doesn't mean that money answers everything that pertains to life. That's a life from the pit of hell. And that's what we have seen also in Ecclesiastes uh, 7 verse 12. And I, was, and I was asking myself, does money heal cancer? No. So it is not true that money answers right all things. Cancer does not respond to money. Does money buy life? No. If money could buy life, so many people would be alive now. Does money make one happy all the time? No. Not, not, it can make you happy for a moment, but not all the time. And so we have people that have money and still commit suicide. Does money resurrect people from the dead? No, money cannot give resurrection from the dead. Can money prevent one from going? Can money prevent one from going to hell if we don't obey God? No. So that that means money cannot prevent, or can money give me access to heaven? No. So that means that money is not visa to heaven, and money cannot restrain me from going to hell. Praise the Lord. Now, it is important that we, that we exegese this. We're coming online now. It's better, it's important that we expound all of this to show that, look, money is as powerful and as relevant for life to as much of degree that we place on it. Let's go online, man. Online uh, contribution. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, sir. Yeah, um, I... I want to say that 
you um there is a bit of travelization in that thing that um money will not cure cancer but money would make it easier for you to cope with cancer money will not give life but money will make life easier to live the context at which solomon was saying that thing which we need to get it it's not it is to tell us the importance of money. And trust me, my brother, if there is no money, even we will not be seated here. I, so I the importance of money cannot be... Money... They're not underplaying it. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. Are you hear me, sir? Maybe... Go ahead, sir. I would explain. Maybe you just joined us. But go ahead. Okay. Hold on. Go ahead, sir. I'm actually here now. Your cap is still on, by the way. Your cap is still on. Oh, sorry. But uh, let me just ask, did you hear the context? Did you hear the context in which I made this statement? Yes, I did. I was okay, listening to that you. Is, that is to say that, that is to say that money does not, not that money is not important, but that money does not answer everything that pertains to life. So you can go ahead. Well, in that context, yes. Yes, okay. I just wanted to know, but you can go ahead. Yes. Okay, so why am I saying what I'm saying is, like you said, a lot of preachers use that particular verse to say um, money is, this money is, even money is the vehicle for evangelism. Yes, we'll come to all of that. Yes. So, I, I just wanted to point out, see, money is, after every other thing is just money. And before every other thing is money. That's all state. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have, we have, we have a contribution online. Thank you very much. And I, and I totally agree with you. I need money. For the cars I'm driving, it's money. For the mic I'm using, it's money. For, but, but, okay, okay. Let's, good evening. Let's go online. Good, good evening. <laughs> Let's go good on. evening. Yes, good evening. Good evening, everybody. My name is Yinka Odunto. I just want to add to what has been said. Truly, as the scripture said, money answers all things. But money cannot do everything. That is just the simple truth about it. If I need an inquiry how to get pregnant and I want to do some special uh, uh, things when I've been waiting for years to get children, Money will give me information, but there is no guarantee that I can get that child. That is just the simple truth about it. Money answers all questions, but money don't do everything. Thank you. Th th thank, thank you very much. Again, so everybody's contribution is very useful. Money is important. We are not saying money is not important. The, the topic is losing the love, the attachment. And I thank God for this uh, Holy Spirit given definition from the from from also from the Bible. I mean, from the book Bible dictionary, a strong emotional. So the topic is focused on strong emotional attachment to desire to pose to to possess and be in the presence of money, as in comparison with God or the purpose or the intent for it. Praise God. Yes, Mon. Praise Lord. Yeah, hallelujah. Um, yes, After I this, agree. we'll go to the next scripture. And I we'll agree come that on money later. is very important, right? But when you say after everything is money, I'll let you know that when you're facing serious illness, then you know that money is nothing. It's absolutely rubbish. At least I can tell you from, first, from experience that when you're facing a, a diagnosis that is like like a dead sentence, you'll now find out that all the money you have is nothing because that money is now useless to you. You can't use it to get the help. You can't use it for anything. So money after it is not after everything is not money. Health <laughs> is still there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank thank you very much, ma. All all contributions are well taken. Money is important. Money is not everything. And I, you know, when I was chosen to lead this, 
Actually, let me reveal one secret. I'm one of the people that I've told God, if there's anything that I've told God I want to be able to display to this world, is that money is nothing. You know, I looked at money, and, and please, we're not being philosophical here. We're talking as Christians. We're talking in the context of the scripture. This is Bible, and, and as Paul said, or was it Peter? He says, that which we have, that which you have heard, that which you have seen, and that which you have heard of, concerning the word of life, that we speak, you know? Um, and, and, some, and I'm sure a lot of us have testimonies of the things that God has done in our lives. There are people that have money. They don't have it. They don't have it. I've been in situations where big people, I, I can't mention, big people, influential and everything, crisis situation, big people, big name, everything, they could not solve it. It was a small boy. I just made a phone call and the problem was solved. Their money could not buy it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's look at Deuteronomy 18, uh, Deuteronomy 8, verse 18. Deuteronomy, because of time, we need to, we need to. Um, so we are looking, we're still on the, the second subtopic. What does the Bible say about money from these passages? It says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives power to give wealth that he may establish his covenant, he swore to your fathers as it is in heaven. So here he's talking about the purpose for money. Let's go online. Contributions, please. Contribution to Deuteronomy 8.18. Okay, so no contribution. Thank you very much. Let's look at Luke 16, verse 13. Thank you. Okay, you want to read it? Do you want to read it? Or you want to make a contribution? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. So here in this particular scripture, it also lays credence to the question that was asked before that when we talk about money here, are we talking about physical money, the money that we spend and all of that? So yes, we're talking about physical money. Here. And he's saying that, you know, that the competition as Christians, the only thing that competes the most between us and God, um, at least in the context of this scripture, is money. Is money, praise God. So the, let's go to the third, top, um, the third question. How is the love of money exemplified in this scripture? Matthew chapter 26, 23 to 25. Someone can read it. Yes, online, please. Is someone reading online? Sorry, uh, my hand was up for... Deuteronomy 18 and Luke 13. I'll contribute to those ones and then read this one. For Deuteronomy 18, we are being asked to give glory to God for the wealth we have, not to think that we did whatever we did, achieve whatever we achieved because we were smart or better than others. And that money should also be used to glorify God. And then in Luke 16, 13, when money becomes an idol in one's life, where one places money above God, it takes the place of God in one's life. And when this happens, it is impossible to love the money and also be devoted to God. Um, Matthew 26, 23. Is it part of uh, number three? Sorry. He answered yes, and said, yes, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish should betray me. Okay. Yes, it is. He was talking about uh, Zacchaeus and anyway. Judas. But I was, yes. I thought I, it was 22, Luke 22. Three. Okay, go ahead. The you scriptures are, saying, are correct, man. I will show you the link. It's actually, what no. happened there is this. They linked mm. Matthew 26 to Luke 22 so that we can now discuss it. So if we read Matthew oh. 22, Okay. To, and now read Luke 22, then it makes it will make sense. So I should read Luke so 22. Go ahead, ma. Yes, ma. Just go ahead, ma. Yes, ma. Okay, let me I've read Matthew 26, 24. Okay, so let me read it again. The son of man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. 
it would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Luke 22, 3 to 5. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi. <laughs> oh, um, uh, Scream Master, you're confusing. Or <laughs> you, yeah, I, think it's I don't know. <laughs> so, so go back to Matthew. Go back. No, go back to stay on that Matthew 26, then verse 25. So I think Mommy OK Culture was trying to read verse 25, and you took it away. Then Judas. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said it. Yes. So, so in this context, before you cannot, scream master, I cannot go to Luke 22. So the essence of this scripture is that so that we know that, you know, Jesus Christ said, someone is going to betray me. And he went around. And he now came to Jesus, Judas, so he said, Rabbi, is it I? And what was Jesus' answer? I said, you have said so. Okay, so let's now go to Luke 22, verse 3 to 5. What does he now say? Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. Mm -hmm. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains yes. how he might betray him to them. That's five. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So the question is, um, how is the love of money exemplified in these scriptures? I think it's just straightforward. Judas, because of uh, the love of 30 shekels of silver, betrayed his master and friend. And we see it in these days. We've heard of uh, people living with others or relatives conniving with kidnappers to kidnap others just because of money. So... I think it's a straightforward uh, something. Thank you. Thank you very much, man. I'd like to add something to it. You know, when I was reading that scripture, I also thought that there was a mistake. I said, ah, what has this got to? Ah, this doesn't look. It's just saying, are you going to betray me? But God showed me something there. So that's what Mommy Okikocha said. Jesus Christ said, someone is going to betray me. And they went around. And he came to Judas. Judas, um, Judas said, is it me, Master? I said, you have said so. To be forewarned is to be what? Is to be forehand. You would expect that having been told that, having been revealed that I am the one that is going to betray by the Son of God, what will I do that I would trace my steps backwards, right? But what happened? He still went ahead. The, that love, there was nothing he could do about it, quote and unquote. Because he had gotten to a place where he had become, according to our definition, become strong emotionally attached to money. Anything to make deals. And that's, all, and, that's the, and that's the essence of this particular topic today. Losing the love of money. Where money, the money, he said, he said there, and Satan entered, not demon now. It was Satan himself that sat on the neck of Judah, Judas. That means that he had, he had, he had Satan. They had become so pallid. They had gotten to the realm where he couldn't repent again. So for me, what it shows me is this. We can get to a state where we love money so much that we will do, we will stop at nothing to get that money for 30 shekels of silver. Praise the Lord. That was just, that was just my own addition. Ah, okay. So Genesis 31, 14 to 15. So there we saw that uh, Judas in the scripture he exemplified the love of money, the extent of how with the love of money. Then Genesis 31, 14. Anybody wants to read? Any, someone that has not spoken, just read it. It can be from here. We have online. Or um, if it, uh, can, can we take someone from here? Does anybody want to? Okay, online. Let's read from online just to read. Go ahead. Anybody online? Someone... Okay. In the interest of time, then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, is there still any portion or interest for us in our father's house? Are we not considered strangers by him? For he has sold us and also completely consumed our money. Praise the Lord. Okay, because of time, let me just explain this part to us. We know that Rachel and Leah, 
they are who? They are, children, they are, they are daughters of who? L Laban. And, and, and they, they, they had more or less, they had become the wife of um, Jacob. And for Jacob to marry them, he had to do what? He had to work for them. So he had to earn. So in, in essence, and that's why, and that, this, this scripture then comes to what our partner was saying, that are we talking only in terms of physical money? Because you will see here that it was Laban that was giving money to, no, it was um, Jacob that was laboring for Laban, so it wasn't physical money that was being exchanged in this context, but value was being exchanged. And we know that money is just, it's just an exchange of value. It's a means of, it's a currency of exchange of value, okay? And what then happened? After a while, Jacob became very smart. And what did he do? We all know the story. He was able to make his own wealth and he ran away. And Laban discovered that, you know what? This guy had made more money than me. And so Laban wanted to more or less um, kill him. And so he ran away. So in the context of this scripture, when that got to this scripture, you know, he was explaining to his wives that, look, you know what? This is what happened. Now your father wants to kill me, you know? And they then said to themselves that, well, yeah, after all, our father sold us for what? For, for money, praise the Lord. So that is also an example of, so he transacted with, with the two, with the, with, the, with the daughters. That was what he did. Because don't forget, and I hope... Um, I hope I'm clear. I can see some people looking a bit. Uh, I hope I'm clear. We all know the story. The person that Jacob really wanted to marry was Rachel, right? We all know. But what happened? He got drunk. And then what happened? Laban gave him Leah because he was drunk. <laughs> Deceived him, yes. <laughs> According to the customs of the land. And he did what? He went into him. And went into her. Why? Why did he go into her and could not recognize that wasn't Rachel? Because he was drunk. But that's another thing. Let's go and check it. Bible study. We have a, we have a man of God here. That was all happened. <laughs> or maybe, maybe it's just me. I'm sorry. Maybe it's just me. But anyways, maybe he wasn't drunk. But... And maybe it was, anyways, but it was deceived, right? But the question here, if you go to that scripture, I don't want us to be, to, I don't want to distract you, but I'm just trying to say that it was a transaction that happened between Laban and Jacob. And as a result of that transaction, right, you know, it got to a place where Laban even wanted to kill. Money being the root of all evil, praise God. So let's go to the, let's, okay, we have, we have someone online. Let's take it then and we'll take the last, um, we'll take the last topic because of time. I just wanted to add that he used his daughters to extort money from Jacob. Like it was like doing business with his daughters because of answering the questions. So how is it exemplified? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, man. And that's, and that's very correct. So, um, Let's go to the last topic because of our time. How can the disciples of Jesus lose the love of money? Second Kings 12, 4 to 5. Does anybody want to read? Chris, screen master, please, can you, can you share it on the screen? Thank you, sir. Screen master. Screen Master. Second Kings 12, 4 to 5. Thank you. And Jehoash said to the priest, all the money of the dedicated gifts that are brought into the house of the Lord, each man's census money, each man's assessment money, and all the money that a man purposes in his heart to bring into the house of the Lord. Let the priests take it themselves, each from his constituency, and let them repair the damages of the temple wherever any dilapidation is found. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And I, this verse actually serves what I wanted to talk about and point out. We must see money for what money is. Money is the most important tool. The purpose That's, of money. That is what money is a tool that and if we recognize it for what it is 
it will lose its power over us. A lot of times people think they are their money. No, your money is a tool. Money, that's where money, that's why money answered all things, because it is a tool. It makes things better. Not that it, it will not create that thing, but it will make it better. And it will also help. So, but we must see it for what it is and what it should be used for. If you like, wear diamonds from head to toe. If your money does not impact positively, you are just wasting your time. If there is no benefit to your money, if your money does not impact life, if your money does not cause positive changes, your money is just your money. It's just sitting down somewhere. So the point is the for us to control the love of money and it must see it as a tool. Your car is not you. When you go into your bedroom, your car is outside. You must see it as it is. And you can't eat a cow. You can't finish it. <laughs> Even though you can try, but I doubt if you'll be able to finish it. Yeah, th thank you very much. And you're very, very correct. And that point that you made, you know, Brian wrote to me, actually alluded to it before you came when he, you know, so you're very correct. The purpose of money and what this particular scripture is trying to demonstrate to us that if you now, and if you link this scripture to uh, Deuteronomy 8.18, the money that God has given to, it's not even our money. Nobody here, as far as, as Christians, there's not like my money as a Christian, as a child of God. Yes, God has given to us as stewards, and it is seen in that our note. Praise God. Yes, ma'am. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, I just wanted to add something, but, you know, think about it. You know, when Jesus was healing people, it had nothing to do with money. You know, so money really isn't everything. He didn't, he could have said, go and buy some herbs and drink and all that. He just mixed spat, mixed clay. So he just said, get up and walk. You know, so we must also come to a realization that in as much as it's a tool, it's not that big a tool. You need to debase it because miracles can be worked without that seemingly all-important tool to buy the medication or whatever it is. Thank, thank you very much. And I will tie what, what my brother has said to what you have said, ma'am. So essentially, as we begin to come gather all of these pieces together, what are we seeing? We are seeing that even in the context of Christianity, in the context of us being children, sons and daughters of God, money is, we are the ones that have created money as a tool of exchange and of value. And what we are seeing, based on what you have said, man, what you have also said, sir, is that God is not limited to only money as a means of, ex, of, of, giving, of giving us what we need for life and for godliness. Amen. So in the context of what my brother also said when he initially spoke, when you came in, you know, you can use money. I can use money. If I'm ill, I can use money to access health, right? But the truth about it, not all of the, not all types of health, man. Yes. But the ones that money, the ones that money, that health can provide solution, maybe malaria and everything like that, right? But at the same time, someone that doesn't have money, a poor man, you know, like I have someone, one of my the closest person to me in this world. Any small thing, oh, you know what? Uh, you need to go for checkup outside the country, and I'll be like, eh, everything is not checkup. There's nothing wrong, you know. It is because you have that money. It's because we have that money. If we don't have the money, you won't say that there's one skin rash share and in two months' time, okay, we will carry it to America to go and check. The person that does not have money, what does it do? And you're a child of God. By the stripes of by the stripes, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed, and you will be healed. So plus you that has the physical money to go to America, and me that I don't have the physical money to go to America. Did we achieve the same thing? Praise God. So you see, and, and, this, and this is what God is trying to show us. That, you know, just like, just like we have all said, we need to place money. Once we place money, so what we are beginning to see is that once we place money for what it is, and thank, thanks to our two brothers, obviously, both of them, I know a bit of them, they are entrepreneurs and the other, the priority media, they are money experts, financial people. They know the essence of, once you know the purpose of money, what it serves, it is an errand boy, right? To achieve a purpose, right? Once we know it, then you know that that money is not God, 
Praise the Lord. Yes, yes, ma'am. Let's, let's take you and we'll go online. Yes. Sorry, I, I'm just going to drag you back a bit, you know, um, to explain number four, you have to look at um, number two, Deuteronomy 8.18. Maybe the screen master can put it on. Deuteronomy 8.18. Yes. You know, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that we may establish his covenant, who he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. So money, according to the biblical text, I'm going to tie two and four together. It's covenant wealth. It's not seen as money. A covenant is a partnership. It's a promise from one person to the other. So when you're, the purpose in which you have money is to a partner with God for his purpose. I hope I'm making sense. Spot on my record. Yes. When you now go to verse 4, I believe I'm thinking in line with the person that wrote this. I mean, number 4. How can the disciples of Jesus lose the love of money? Second Kings 12, 4 to 5 is talking about if there's a need in the church. Correct. The temple breaks down. That's right. You use it to build the temple. That's one of the uses. Luke 16, 9 to 11 is talking about using it to gain friends. It's not talking about just friends like that. It's to help your friends, love your neighbor as yourself. And then it now goes to Exodus 22 verse 25, which is that you must help the poor. You can be putting it in the scriptures, yes. you know. And then Matthew 17, 17 is talking about tax. Tax. They asked him, should we pay tax? That's right. He said, give all to Caesar to pay tax. Tax is to build the country, to build for the benefit of all. So if you understand the use of money, you will lose the love of money because you understand what the purpose of money is. It's not for selfishness. It's to be a partner in the kingdom of God. It's a partnership. You know, thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. In fact, you've, just, you've made the work there very, very easy. We'll go online now. That's, that's very, very spot on and excellent exegesis. Online, please. Yeah, thank you, Sister Nike. You just uh, you just um, like summarize what I was saying in question one, and I had wanted to read uh, then this popular passage, First Timothy six, and so on. But because there was no time, let me take Exodus twenty two twenty five, and it says, "If you lend money to any of my people who are poor among you, you shall not be like a money lender to him." you shall not charge him interest. So in ad addition to what I've been said on this question, how does a disciple lose the love of money? Lose it means like losing the appetite for the love of money. And I think that the first thing is to ask for the grace of God and God to bless you with contentment. And we have it in 1 Timothy 6, 7. Contentment. And also to realize that you are blessed to be a blessing to others. And also be careful how money you have is affecting your spiritual health. Is it making you go against God's word? Or is it making you to be a blessing and glorifying the name of God? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, ma'am. So as I've, as I've, as I've tagged uh, this... Uh, Subtopic number four, it shows us the, the purpose of money. One of, the, one of the ways we can lose the love of money is to understand its purpose, you know. And, um, and we also, so four and two, as has been exegesis, um, they are actually tied together because God has given us money. Money is actually like talent. I wrote it in part of my notes, you know. If there are things that we will account for at the end of uh, uh, time here on earth will account for with people say talent Abby that part of that talent is talent they, some people have called this the three I mean the, the not the three T's but the, we account for time we account for our talent and what's the third one treasure yes treasure which is the same thing as money so we are custodians and of course he has given us all things to enjoy we need 
this money for day to day with to send our children to school to and everything like that. But we must understand that the essence of the wealth that God has given to us is for the establishment of God's kingdom here and earth. Praise the Lord. So can someone read the conclusion for us? Please? Yes. Yes, sir. The, the cost of being a disciple is highly demanding. However, we must understand that heaven's riches are far more valuable than earth, earthly wealth. But if we are not trustworthy with our money here, no matter how little or how much, we will be unfit to handle the vast riches of God's kingdom. Do not let your commitment to follow Christ as a true disciple slip in monetary matters. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so we have the food for thought. Someone wants to read that for us? Okay, we should all read it. Someone says we should all read it. Food for thought. Let's go together. Monetary wealth is not a do or die affair. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> yes. Somebody said we should tell some of our politicians. I can't mention that. <laughs> oh, so, uh, <laughs> sorry, sir, you have your contribution. Tell oh, we should tell Akwabio. <laughs> that is not a do or die affair. Okay, I get the joke now. <laughs> if that is, okay, let's not go into that. Memory verse. No one can serve two masters. Either you will need one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Matthew 6, verse 24. Praise the Lord. Amen. Um, so we thank God for, uh, the, for, the, for, for the lessons that we have learned here, and we pray that God in his mercies would, um, would, would make us true disciples and true stewards of his manifold riches that he has committed to us in Jesus name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that has gone that has gone forth today. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that has that has taught each and every one of us through each and every one of us. Lord, we ask oh God that these lessons, these scriptures that we have used that you have used to speak to us, that they will, con they will not stand against us in the day of judgment in the name of Jesus. That in this time of Lenten season, Father, that your word, that the will to do, the grace and the will to do in accordance with your word, we receive right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And at the end of the day, all glory shall be yours, and the blessings shall be ours. Thank you, Father, for in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. So it's time for sorry, the grace. Okay, let's just share the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.